Hi guys, it's Tony Robbins. You're listening to Habits and Hustle. Crush it. Hi, Doug. How are you? <laughs> I am good. How are you? Good. Thanks for coming on the podcast. I am excited to be here. I am very excited to have you. I, I've told you that now probably like 4,000 <laughs> times prior to this podcast, but um, okay, so today on Habits and Hustle, we have Doug Hirsch. And for you guys who don't know who Doug is, he is the co founder of a company called Good RX. And if you don't know what it is and are not using it yet, this is your lucky day because we're going to save you so much money. And this is not an ad. I am very serious. Doug has disrupted the entire healthcare system. Uh, and we're going to learn all about it. Sounds so, good. Thanks let's, for coming. Let's do it. All right. So like I said, so first of all, why don't you tell people what good for, for those of you who don't know what good RX is, what it is, and we can kind of just go from there. GoodRx helps people understand um, the cost of healthcare ultimately, because in this country, because of the ridiculous system that we have in place, uh, everything is a mystery, right? I mean, imagine walking into any store or buying any service where you don't know what something costs. And yet the biggest industry we have in this country, the $4 trillion healthcare market mm. has no price tags, right? And so you're left in a situation where too many Americans just simply don't go to the doctor or don't go to the pharmacy because they're like, if I go, I'll get, I'll be bankrupted, right? I think the average American has something like $400 in their, in their bank account. And so any event like that would literally just, you know, end their financial security. So um, really our, our whole mission has always just been to try to bring education and information to Americans so that they can make decisions and take control of their healthcare budget, just like you do in any other category. And so that's what we do. We've, we, you know, we've helped many Americans, about 20 million Americans a month use our product. Um, but really we're just trying to, to be an advocate for patients and to build some trust in an industry that really doesn't have it. Right. Oh, I want to just even take it down even like to the most basic level. Yeah. Literally, you guys can like download the GoodRx app. Yes. Yes. You can you can like Google and you can put in the search any drug. If you go to a Walgreens and you have to get whatever medication yeah. and they say the drug is sixty five dollars, you just literally say the name da, 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 in, in the search engine mm -hmm. and then all these other places that have that drug for cheaper pop up. I kid you not, this is, and it's that simple. And people sometimes think there has to be a catch and there's literally no catch. Yeah. That's yeah. as easy, like that, and that just happened. And then that's how I kind of figured it out. I was years ago, I was going somewhere looking for, I had a medication and it was $195. I was like, what the hell? And this is with insurance. <laughs> yep. And then I went on that search engine and it was, the, you know, put it in and then the drug across the street at the Ralph's across from that Walgreens, it was twenty seven ninety nine. Twenty that's a massive gap yeah. in in price. And you're not and this is not something you have to pay for to get this advantage. It is literally that simple. And that's why I'm telling you this app, this company is such a disruptor and it will save you so much money. And that's why I'm like, I'm like just <laughs> love you so so like how, so let me ask you why are the prices first of all so different from like from one place to another from one pharmacy to a grocery store like the same exact drug yeah so healthcare is unlike Actually, you have to really suspend common sense, right? I okay. think most people, when they want, think about any business, you think, okay, well, you know, I buy this bottle for a dollar and I sell it for two and I make a dollar of profit, right? It's right. pretty straightforward. But healthcare doesn't work that way in this country because in healthcare, there's a third party involved. So like we talked about insurance, right? So, you know, there's you, there's the seller of whatever product or service, and then you've got this insurance company sitting in the middle messing up everything. And it's not that insurance companies are bad. They're working on behalf of both you and maybe the company you're right. employed by or the plan. Um, but the problem is, is it, it just creates like irrationalities. So for example, let's, let's use drugs as an example. So common generic drugs effectively cost nothing to make. There's dozens of manufacturers around the globe. Um, so if you take say Crestor, like I take, which is a common statin that millions of Americans take for high cholesterol, you know, the hard cost of goods of that product is a dollar or two. Let's just say the pharmacy acquires it for three. But then the pharmacy has to deal with the insurance companies. They're called PBMs in the, in the drug industry, but just call them insurance companies for sake of argument, who then say, hey, I represent millions of Americans and I want a deal. You got to give me 80% off the cost. And the pharmacy goes, oh, 80% off, that's a lot. But uh, I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll take this $2 drug, I'll make it 200. And then when I give you 80% off, I can still make a profit, mm -hmm. right? And then in the old days, nobody cared. This was all just boring industry stuff that you didn't care about. But then what happened is um, insurance got worse and worse in this country. So like when I entered the workforce, you know, again, if I just had a card and, you know, my parents said, get a job with good insurance, life was good. 
But then what happened is you got these big deductibles and all these fancy words that honestly most people don't understand. There's prior authorizations and step therapy and and shorting form, uh, short formulas. The, the whole point of these things is basically saying, hey, we're just going to pay for less. The insurance mm-hmm. company and you, the patient, are going to pay for more. And so what ends up happening is that that silly $200 price you were never supposed to see, you're seeing it. And so when you and I show up at the pharmacy, all of a sudden something that costs two costs 200. But if you go across the street, like you said, it could be 22. And so what we do is we just bring all these different data points together and we show you where there's really great opportunities to save because there are really amazing ways to save and we can walk through some of those today. But, you know, literally, you know, you shouldn't pay $200 for something and yet too many people do when you could literally pay like five or 10 or some cases even free. Um, but you got to know where to look. And so think of us as like Expedia of healthcare, right? You know, just like imagine the old days when you, you know, when you'd look up a plane flight, you just call United Airlines and whatever the price was, you'd be OK. But you don't do that anymore. Right. Right. Well, we want to bring that to healthcare, where you don't just go, OK, you you actually do your homework and very easily find out how to save. Yeah. No, I mean, like it's so it's amazing. So how did you guys figure out this whole I mean, not to give away like the secret sauce oh, no. here. <laughs> oh, this is exactly how we did it. Here's exactly. how we do it, everybody. <laughs> it's like, um, very easy. You just do this and this. Yeah. No, but like tell us like the how the origin, how this started. Sure. And what the process was to even get like to even think of that. Yeah. So it all started back uh, in 2010. Um, I had worked at Facebook. I was the head of product at Facebook. And then after Facebook. That's it. Um, You're a real loser. <laughs> that's you, it. Doug? After Facebook, I uh, was kind of trying to do something entrepreneurial. I was ready to work for myself and not really work, um, uh, you know, for someone else. And um I had teamed up with two great guys. One guy was, uh, I actually uh, built photo tagging at Facebook. So if you've ever tagged a photo on Mm -hmm. Instagram or anything like that, that was something that me and my, uh, one of my co-founders built. Um, And then- um, That was you? It was me and two other guys, yeah. So we invented this concept of tagging a photo, (laughs) which, you know, seemed kind of obvious at the time, but um, um, yeah, no, it's it's a thing. So it's a a a thing. thing. (laughs) Um, And so we uh, we teamed up because he had moved down here. And then a third friend who I'd met through my mom, I think at a, Break the fast for you know Yom Kippur or something like that. Is that the one where you fast? Yes, I forget. it is. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, three of us were hanging out, and we all thought we would have an incubator, and we would like each of us would start a business. And on Fridays, we'd have lunch, and we chit chat about our businesses. Um, and then I had this experience of going to a pharmacy just like you um, in Santa Monica, and I walked in with a prescription in hand, and they said it'd be five hundred bucks, and I was like, "That's a lot." My doctor did not warn me this would be five hundred bucks because. I'm not sure I want to take it for 500 bucks. Right. And because I'm also naturally thrifty, I took it back and I went to the pharmacy <laughs> next door where I didn't perceive any difference in quality. It was just a different pharmacy. And they said 250. Then I took it to a third pharmacy where this really nice woman was like, it's 400 bucks. And I was like, wow, that's a lot. And she chased me to the parking lot. And she was like, I know I said 400, but I really want you to get your medication. I want you to be healthy. Uh, and so she's like, let's work out a deal. And I was like, am I buying a used car? Am I buying a prescription? Like it was just bizarro. And so I brought it back to Trevor and Scott and I was just like, what's going on here? Can we get our hands on this information? And so then I'm from New York. Yeah. My father lives in Manhattan. And I found out just by Googling that if in New York state, you can walk into any pharmacy and you can say, I demand a price list and they are supposed to give you one. I dare you to do that because if you go into any pharmacy in New York and you say that, they will go, what are you talking about? Right. <laughs> so, my, uh, so my father went in and demanded a price list and the guy looked at him strangely and then my dad quoted the statute and the guy went in the back and scribbled something down and none of it was right, by the way, but it was bits and pieces of information, right? right. And then we found out that 14 states actually had a, a law where they had to publish data. They were all wrong. Like they dropped the decimal point. So instead of being $36.99, it'd be $3,699. So they're all this like wow. starts and stops. But V1 of GoodRx was really just scraping data off the internet and trying to put it together without a business model and just be like, hey, next time you're thinking of a prescription, here's some information that might help. And that was where it all started from. So this was literally your your brain, like you thought of this and then brought in the people to kind of help you make this happen. I mean, yeah, these were my co-founders yeah. and amazing partners. And, and um, you know, I, I definitely could not have done this alone. Like we all, it's, we, we ran the businesses, all three of us as sort of co-CEOs for a long time. And um, it's the best because we all have very diverse skill sets. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think, you know, this experience I had, plus my, my co-founders knowledge of business and just, you know, we called every, we didn't know anything about pharma. So we just kept calling random, you know, people we met on LinkedIn or something. And we're like, Hey, you look like you're in pharma sales. Can you tell me how your price is figured out? And they'd sometimes they'd hang up, but more often than not, they'd be like, yeah, let's talk about this. And it was really, I was amazed at how welcoming this foreboding industry was. And we found a lot of experts and they, the doors open here and a door open there. And next thing you know, we had a business. 
Wow. So how long did it actually take you to get that algorithm or the whole business figured out? I would imagine a while because you're, you're creating it from scratch, right? Um, I mean, I won't say that the first version of GoodRx was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I think some of our prices might not have been right. Um, but we launched it at a, 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 an event called a Health 2.0 in San Francisco in the fall of 2011. Um, and at that point, you could just do a search for some drugs and get some information at some pharmacies. And then I met a bunch of people at that conference who knew a friend and their cousin's dog knew someone. Right. Um, and then we found out about other ways that we could work with insurance companies to actually get really, really low prices. And we could, you know, work with some pharmacies to get low prices. And it was just start, you know, bits and pieces, start and stop a lot of hustle, right? A lot, yeah. of, a lot of just like, what if we try this? Oh, that didn't work. What if we try this? That didn't work. Because healthcare is so complex. It's, like, so, it's so complicated. Yeah. I mean, yeah. even the smartest of the smart people, like, it's hard to even like bring it down to the layman's, you know, to a to a language that people can understand because there's so many moving parts all the time. Yeah. And you guys didn't have a, none of you have a background in healthcare, right? Nothing. You or your partners. Nothing. So this was just you having this, like going, having this experience and being like, hey, you know what? Why don't we try to do this? And like had to really start from scratch. But isn't that where all good ideas, I mean, at least for me, that's where all good ideas come from. You know, you're, yes. you're sitting around your kitchen and you're going, gosh, why does this bottle top work like this? What if it worked like that? Or this microphone seems like it could be better. You know, whatever the, like for me, at least I feel like as an entrepreneur, right. that, that's my life, which is I'm always looking around and going, that just seems silly. Why are we doing it that way? When right. We could do it this way. Or just listening to your friends and family going, I, this is a pain point for me. Like, like I, this, I'm struggling to solve this thing. And you know you may not be able to solve it, but maybe you can, right? Yeah. And so that's, I don't know, that's my obsession. So. Well, you did it. I mean, did you have to raise a lot of money for this? Like what was the kind of, so you got this idea, you tell your partners, mm -hmm. I mean, then what happens, right? Because to, to figure out that type of algorithm would take some kind of capital, I would imagine, right? So, I mean, you came from yeah. Facebook. I mean, I'm sure you're not exactly poor before that, but. We hired an engineer on our own, um, just the three of us, um, a really great guy who uh, I just saw today, actually. Um, and, um, we, you know, kind of threw this V1 of it up then. And even, I mean, this was 11 years ago, but even today, it's really easy to get something basic up, right? Like, right. And I, I feel like so many people I meet, they're like, gosh, if only I you know, had a million dollars. You don't necessarily need a million dollars. You know, there's lots of tools out there that can make something uh, relatively efficient to get up. And so we, um, yeah, we got together and we found this engineer and then um, we didn't really raise a ton of money. We raised about a million and a half bucks in a, in a convertible note. Um, but it was really more just once we had started to got some momentum, we were like, all right, we've put enough of our own money into this. Let's see if right. anybody, mostly also because they would open up doors for us because maybe our investor knew someone and maybe, you know, maybe they had a different perspective, but we actually ran the company. We always, well, I'd say until relatively recently run the company pretty thrifty, much like my original experience. <laughs> um, like we never wanted to get ahead of ourselves. I, I don't exactly quote me on this, but I want to say we were profitable from like 2012 onwards. Right. I mean, we, we early on, like, we're like, we're not going to, we're not going to be like that typical Silicon Valley company that, you know, is buying blimps and rocket ships, right, and, right. you know, going all in and spending hundreds of millions of dollars, hoping that they'll get some traction. We, we kind of traction first, and then we would slowly but surely increase our marketing and stuff. That's incredible. So what was the first thing you did marketing wise to get the word out? Because you guys were profitable. I mean, it's an amazing idea. So it was it word of mouth. What was the kind of where? What did you do? I think the, the the secret sauce for us has always been our relationship with healthcare professionals, with doctors, with pharmacists, with the front of office of a doctor. You know, because one of the amazing things, I should mention also that it wasn't just the three of us. Like I have a very close friend who's a primary care doctor at USC here. Uh, and she's my companion, a lot of this stuff. Cause every day, every time I see her, I think she thinks I'm crazy. Cause I'm constantly like, tell me what happened today. Tell me what happened to the, like what, what's going on with you. And cause it's so broken and it seems like there's yeah. a thousand ways to improve. And, um, and early on, I realized, wait a second, you know, when we first demoed our product at health 2.0, um, it was all these physicians who came up to me and they're like, oh my God, I've been looking for this forever because it kind of sucks yeah. when you're a doctor and you write a prescription because you see the patient needs something and then they don't take it. Right. And cost right. is one of the big reasons why patients are just like, forget it. I'm not going to do that thing. And doctors are really good people. You didn't go to law school, uh, law school, to medical <laughs> school for, for, you know, X number of years and get that much into debt so that you could just make a quick buck. They actually want to help people. And so we found that their desire to help people merged with the content and information we could give them. And so doctors have been our greatest advocates since the beginning. And I think, you know, getting that trust. Of course, you know, when your doctor tells you to do something, generally, if you mean you can afford it, people right. do it. So um, I think that was one of our early, uh, I'm not going to say we were geniuses and figured it out. It's just we saw that opportunity. We saw that the doctors were really resonating with these tools. 
And we, we continue to build products and research and information that would help doctors to keep their patients healthy. I so, mean, I wonder how, I mean, I'm sure you have these stats, like how many people have been, their lives have been saved because to your point, that's even me and you and other people who have some expendable income and you see a crazy price on that. You're like, oh, screw it. I don't need it. It's not, yeah. I don't feel any symptoms. And so probably a lot of things just go unnoticed until it's too late because they just don't want to get that medication. I mean, my obsession from early on has been, we do a terrible, terrible job in this country on preventative care, mm -hmm. right? Like yes. we're pretty good. Like if you fall over on the street, an ambulance will pick you up and it'll take you to the ER and you'll end up in the operating room and then you'll get dialysis or whatever the thing is. Like we do that and we spend a fortune on it. Mm -hmm. Just so everyone understands in your audience, the US healthcare system is, is really not good. Obviously we spend, I think it's three or four X what other OECD countries spend and our outcomes are way worse. I think we're number 11 out of like the 17 countries in the, in the what is it, OECD. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're number 11, that is number, so yeah. crazy. And I mean, just to be clear, spending four times more to achieve number 11, you, yeah. you wouldn't make it very far in most, nope. most other. Um, <laughs> and you know, life expectancy actually, I believe is even decreasing, not just because of COVID, but because like the outcomes are awful right. for people. And we're just spending money on the wrong things. Like I was just listening to a, a, pod, a different podcast other than what? this amazing one. I know I, I cheated on you. <gasps> Um, sure that was, it was talking about how one we'll edit that out actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's get rid of that. 1% of the America's GDP, our gross domestic product goes toward dialysis, right? Wow. Like that's a huge amount of money. That's like on the order of many other things that you would assume our government spends money yeah. on. And this is just to be clear, end stage renal disease when your kidneys have failed because you know, whatever that thing was supposed to happen beforehand did not happen. It's, you don't just wake up with end stage oh. renal disease. Usually you, you know, you have a lifetime of bad behavior and you don't go to the doctor and you don't take those medications. Right. And it's like, imagine, and just to be clear, the meds that might keep you from becoming diabetic are anywhere between two and maybe 500 bucks, right? If you have insurance, we just actually launched a program at GoodRx where it can be free. So it's like, really? you have opportunities Talk about to that. solve this problem. You can solve the problem for $2 or you mm -hmm. can solve it for like $3 million a patient later on. The problem is our system, unlike say Canada, for example, is that we, we're not designed that way. We're designed around a profit based system. Yeah. We're not designed to look at, you know, if I'm your employer right now, I don't know if I care so much about what happens to you when you're 60, right? Right. I really just want to control my costs and make sure that you don't quit. That's pretty much the extent of my goals. Yeah, right? exactly. And then why even with insurance? I mean, people have these really, ex you know, uh, fancy, expensive, plans and it's still not even helping. Yeah, because what happens is people assume that they're paying a lot for something and then it must be good. But then what ha people just don't understand these terms. I, I read something recently, only 7% of Americans know what a deductible even is, know what that word is, or max out of pocket. I don't expect your audience to know what these words are. You shouldn't have to know what these words are, but the system we have is such that that's the world you live in. And so, you know, everyone goes out there and they get insurance, but they don't look at the fine print. And the fine print says that you have a $5,000 deductible or that only six yeah. drugs are on the formulary and the one you need is not there, which means you get that $200 price we talked about yeah. before. Or, you know, you have an emergency room copay or here's the new one. The new term in the industry as a few years ago is coinsurance. Sounds like yes. a nice word, but it's not such a good word. A copay means you pay $10 and that's it. Coinsurance means if it's a $20,000 visit and you have a 50% coinsurance, you're paying $10,000, right? And so coinsurance oh is a fancy word for we're sticking it to you. And so, you know, and, and it's not that I blame any player in the system. It's the nature of the system. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, all these companies we're talking about have shareholders and, you know, and are trying to control costs on behalf of someone else. Right. Right. Um, but anyway, it's a mess. It is a mess. Yeah. So you started off just with doing the the drugs, like the prescription drugs. And then you've obviously, like you were saying about this program, which I'll get to, has expanded. I know you guys bought Hey Doctor mm -hmm. a couple a few years ago to do mm -hmm. telemed. When was that? Like a couple of years ago, right? Uh, 2019. Yeah. 2019. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So be between that and telemedicine, was there anything else that you guys were kind of developing or that was the second trial? Like um, a few things. I mean, so we traditionally play in the generic drug side, mm -hmm. which everyone falls asleep when they say those words, but that is <laughs> I almost did. that, <laughs> that is 90% of the 4 billion prescriptions written in this country every year. Oh wow! Nobody cares. Like we, it's funny when we were starting to get our ex, I'd, I'd find these like pharma reps and I'd be like, help us with this. And they'd be like generic drugs. Nobody cares. And then I'd go to research and be like, that's 90% of, of the business. Yeah. Um, but well, because that's, also the real drugs are like 
that like 20 right. times or 200 times more expensive. Oh yeah, and we even like, we, we'll, we can talk about brands separate because actually brands of generic drugs work totally differently in terms of pricing. Um, but oh, so, really? but we have started to attack the brand drugs because if you go to GoodRx and like, let's imagine some of the folks in your audience are, are like, oh, GoodRx sounds cool. And so they go and they type in a brand drug. Yeah. Today, for many drugs, you'll see a coupon for $822. You'll be like, well, that's not much of a savings. And right. we know that. And so what we've done is we started reaching out to the manufacturers and said, look, no one's gonna buy this for $822. You see the writing on the wall in Washington. You need to do something. We've got 20 million people a month. And so we're actually making a lot of progress working with manufacturers um, to really bring down those costs. Like we just launched a program um, this past quarter with, uh, I can never pronounce it, Sanofi, which is one of the biggest yeah. uh, drug companies on the planet, where we're making insulins, which is what leads to dialysis. Um, $0 for people with insurance and $99 for people uh, who do not have insurance, which is a lot better than the 500-ish that they were paying before. Um, oh, wow. And again, I. I mean, I care only because that means more people get insulin and don't, you know, end up, uh, you know, going through that whole path yeah. that leads to dialysis and all that. Um, so we're working on a lot of that stuff. And then, of course, we have the telemedicine side, which we can, we can talk about. Yeah, let's now. talk about that. So was that because, you know, uh, when COVID, of course, I, I feel like a lot of these uh, telemedicine companies kind of all kind of started. I, mean, I don't know if they just started or they were working on it, but a lot of them popped up out of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you guys were doing it prior, a little bit prior to that. As Did mm -hmm. you see the trend moving, ticking that way, the pendulum going in that way before? or It's kind of the same thing as what we talked about before, where from my perspective, I was seeing pain points, right? right. Where like a lot of folks were coming to get our ex and they would, you know, oh, that sounds cool. And they'd type in the first letters <laughs> of their drug, they'd see some prices and then they'd go, oh wait, I don't have a prescription. And of right. course in America and many other countries, you need to have a piece of paper right. or an e-prescription. Otherwise you can't get it, right? Another weird oddity about healthcare, right? It's You can't just go out and buy this. You have to have a doctor's permission to buy this. Well, that you can buy, but I, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, you can buy the water. Uh, exactly. So, 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 um, um, you know, we saw that all these people were coming to GoodRx without a prescription. We thought, well, can we do this in an efficient way? Now, there are other plays in telemedicine, but usually they're like, oh, you work for big company X and we want to make sure that you don't show up in the doctor's office because that costs a lot of money. So here's a telemedicine tool that you can use, right. which many people don't use. Like, I bet everyone listening has a telemedicine uh, plan attached to their insurance plan. But unfortunately, insurance isn't very good at talking to their members and getting them to use those services. And the I services didn't know they them, had one. Exactly. But they usually do. It's just nobody really uses them. How come? Why not? Um, they, they don't advertise it because they don't want to be. They, it so many issues. Expense? I mean, the combination of, first of all, like most people don't read or listen or log into their insurance website. Yeah. I think the insurance companies are pretty bad at generally communicating with folks. Um, I think it's kind of just, and I think people also like going into the office and seeing the person in the white coat with the stethoscope and don't quite, That's haven't true. made that loop, that leap until COVID. And, and we can talk about COVID and how that's changed things. But, yeah. and so for us, it was really just simple math. It was, it was basically, you know, hey, look, um, you know, all these people are coming without a prescription. That seems to be a pain point for people. A lot of people don't have a regular doctor relationship either. You know, living here in fancy LA, we're all like, oh, I have my primary care doctor, but that's not the case for many people, especially younger people. By the way, can I, yeah. I want to stop you right yeah. there. It's a hundred percent true. I don't even have, this is a conversation I have with a lot of my friends. I don't have a primary care doctor. And then I start to, in the last few weeks, I've been asking around, like I haven't had a, a proper checkup. And I'm not talking to like right. an OBGYN or specialist. I'm talking a real doc, like a just right. internist. Am I like a strip while you're talking? Is yeah, absolutely. We, 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 and uh, Tatum, you're channeling Channing Tatum or whatever <laughs> yes. his name is. Magic exactly. Mike. Exactly. That's a whole side Magic joke. Yes. Yeah, yes. Magic yes. Mike. Yes. Um, and I, I am not Channing Tatum, just so everyone knows in your audience. I know, we were so. joking <laughs> earlier because he, uh, Doug posted, uh, uh, tweeted something about him the other day. And I was like, why are you tweeting about Channing Tatum? And he's yeah. like, people say that he looks like his older brother. Or his <laughs> or chubby brother. His chubby brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. Which, by the way, you don't. Well, thank but you. that's that's hilarious. I mean, do I say thank you? I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't know, know what to say to that. You could say thank yeah. you. Are you hot? You look like you need like... I'm a little warm, but I'll, I'll keep going. <laughs> do, can we get like, is there like a napkin of some kind or like a paper towel? The guy's like dying of, of heat. It's, it's being nervous next to Jen. That's yeah, what that's is, what really. it is. So. Exactly. Exactly. It's, but, uh, you're, um, you, can't, you can't contain yourself, I know. Exactly. It's the natural uh, Jewish genes in me <laughs> coming through, I think is what it is. It's my extra layer of... <laughs> So, yeah. Oh, oh my go. God. Oh, I get a paper towel. Thank Perfect. you. Thank Perfect. you. Anyway, um, where were we? Okay, where were we? Um, Chating, uh, Tatum, Channing Tatum. I never can get that guy's name right. We were talking about telemedicine. Uh, right? Telemedicine. Right. Oh, yeah. How nobody has a real right. doctor. I mean, so it's not just outside of even LA. I think it's just the system to your point. And by the way, when I lived in Canada, I had a doctor mm -hmm. and it was 
it was kind of much easier. And now with all you think the U.S. being such a rich country, like to your saying, why is that? Why don't we even have doctors? I love talking to people from other countries because I, it's hard to explain, I think, the fear that or the, this additional point that you have to think about when you're an American, which doesn't exist in most other mm -hmm. modern countries, right? I would imagine growing up in Canada, you know, you didn't, or your parents, I guess, didn't didn't say like, oh gosh, you know, if Jen slips and falls, that could bankrupt us, right? Or exactly. if God forbid, you know, Jen is ill, you know, like the, the cost factor was not an issue. Getting right. access to care, sure, is this doctor better? Yes, no. But there was never like this fear that it was going to dramatically impact my finances. Mm -hmm. It's a uniquely American, and obviously some other countries, but I'd say in this kind of OECD world, that's a uniquely American thing, right? Where it's like, I could literally wipe myself out if I slip yes. and fall, right? And that's the part that just really, um, Drives me nuts. You know, it's funny. An another thing happened to me when we started the company, which was um, prior to the ACA, Obamacare, um, my son had had febrile seizures when he was two months old or something oh. like that. And I, I don't know if some of your listeners might remember this, but prior to the ACA, and it may come back, by the way, if the ACA ever goes away, if you try to get insurance, you would have this incredibly invasive experience with a doctor or a nurse who would say to you, hey, Jen, I noticed you have some moles there. Um, when did those moles occur? You know, um, um, that mm -hmm. looks like that could cost us some money. So and, and they would then be like, yeah, we're going to reject you. So my own son, who had had febrile seizures, which I think 20 percent of babies have or some huge number. So imagine getting a note from the insurance company saying, yeah, we're going to cover you and your wife and your daughter, but your son, no way. He's too, he's too expensive for us. Wow. And as a dad, just being like, seriously, like, like that's, this is the system we have where like, because you know, these esoteric decisions by some random person and that just kind of killed me. Yeah. And I was determined to try to fix that. And you know, the ACA has done it for the moment. Pre-existing conditions are, are not uh, a thing, okay. um, but you know, who knows? Depends on the administration and the mood of the day as to whether that will come back or not. That's unbelievable. So, yeah. But even when you call for a doctor though, they're all full here too. You right. can't even get in to see a doctor. The average wait in America for a primary care physician, I believe is 29 days, yeah. But even if you don't have one, like I called 10 doctors to be like, hey, I'm looking for a doctor. They're all, they're not taking new patients. Yep. There's, it's like such, a, the whole thing from the beginning to end is so difficult. So then now you have telemedicine. And then the question is, can you, how do you cover, or not cover, but how does a telemedicine doctor cover or know if they're not doing a physical checkup with you? Yeah. How can you just like sit on a Zoom call with somebody and check for these like things that are like kind of like nuanced and a little bit more difficult and detailed? So I don't think, you know, we shouldn't assume that telemedicine lives in its own World, Silo, or right? Whatever, Meaning, like, yeah. I think most of the uses I think of telemedicine during the pandemic, at least, were, hey, hey, primary care doctor, your your office is closed, but I'd still like to talk to you. And actually, I just saw a study yesterday that most telemedicine was mm -hmm. actually on the phone. We think about video and Zoom, yeah, but no. it was still your doctor calling you and saying, hey, Jen, so what's going on? Blah blah blah, right? Yeah. And I think that's fine, certainly for maintenance of a condition or a common safe drug. I mean, the one I always like to point to is birth control. Like birth control is ridiculous in this country, right? I mean, there are really no side effects of birth control. Right. Women know if they need to be on it, and and you know, and yet you have to get a prescription from a doctor, and then you have to show up at a pharmacy, and it's it just it's so much pain. Yeah, and it it should be much more. Uh, just convenient, yeah. right? Easy, and, and so yeah. and so we launched, among other things. You know, I, I the cost is like ten bucks, I think, with GoodRx Gold, where you'll basically fill out a form. We'll okay. be like, okay, you are a female that deserves to have birth control, and then we'll set we'll send it to you if you have insurance for like zero, right? Because that's what the ACA does cover. Uh, and if you don't have insurance, we'll find an affordable option for you. But it should be like that. It shouldn't be like, I have to wait 29 days and my doctor's busy and they're not taking new patients and I move somewhere else. Like it should just work. It should right? just work. And right. it's not as seamless as that. Nothing, it right. seems like nothing is. Uh, what's GoodRx Gold then? So GoodRx, uh, at some point I'm guessing you'll ask, how do you make money? Yeah. <laughs> Cause everyone does. I know, well actually um, I know how you make money. Oh, I read good. about it, but oh, nice. I, I will ask you to be just so I, you know, look like, you know, just for better conversation for sure. people. Sure. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll, maybe I'll just answer that. We we'll, we make money a few a few different ways. When you come to GoodRx and you find also you can do the interview if you want. You can ask your question. <laughs> I'm going to ask myself, <laughs> Doug. How are you doing? I'm doing great. There you go. Um, yes. Like exactly. You, you can go you know, take a walk. <laughs> that'd be great. Back. That'd be great. Thank you. No, I'm kidding. Go um, ahead. Uh, yeah. So uh, when you come to GoodRx, if you use one of our coupons, which you can find in our app or on the website, um, we make a referral fee. Right. It's pretty usual, like right. other industries. Uh, the insurance company collects the referral fee. They give a piece to us. Um, we, GoodRx Gold is a subscription product where you right. pay 
I think it's $5.99 a month for an individual, and you get even lower prices. So we've worked with certain pharmacies who give us way great prices. And I mean, like, again, how much lower? Give me an oh, example. I mean, like, I think we have hundreds of drugs that are between like three and six dollars. I mean, way lower than your insurance copay for most of these drugs, right? And it's funny because the New York Times reporter called me, I don't know, this was a few years ago, and she was like, I don't believe any of the stuff you're saying. So we went through her copay, her New York Times copay. Yeah. And we found that GoodRx had lower prices 40% of the time. And just to be clear, that assumed that she had hit her deductible, which she hadn't. And that, you know, and that since then, by the way, this was three years ago, prices have come down more. So I would just ballpark that half the time we're finding lower prices than your insurance, right? That's so um, crazy. So we have GoodRx Gold. We have the telemedicine service, which you, you know, pay, but it's a very fair price service. How much? 20 bucks, you said, for? For the doctor's business? Yeah. It actually starts at 10 with GoodRx Gold, and it goes up to like 40 or 50, depending on what your what service you're looking for. What kind of doctors are they? Um, every doctors and MPs, either MDs and or nurse practitioners, you know, people who are eminently qualified to, to provide the service and some are video and sometimes you just fill out a form. If, again, if it's something like birth control, uh, I'm going to, I'm not yeah. kidding you. I'm going to start using that because why yeah. would it, why wouldn't somebody use this? Yeah. I mean, it, it, the, I don't expect telemedicine to eat the world, right? I think people should still go to their doctors and you're seeing that now that COVID's receding, people are going back to their doctor, but I think for ongoing stuff, right? Again, like take me, for example, I'm taking Crestor for the rest of my life. Right. I just am. And unless I need a lab or a test, which you can also do by the way, remotely, um, you know, my doctor yeah. should see me from time to time, but, but I want medical professionals to work to the top of their credential. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, it does. Like the doctors I talk to, it's not, they're not sad that we exist. They're thrilled because like doctors don't want to spend their days writing birth control prescriptions, right? OBGYNs are way more talented than that. Yeah. Right. So let's let them do that. And we'll find, you know, other folks who are still qualified um, to, to, to provide assistance and, you know, make it more affordable. Yeah, right. so. because part it's, it's, it's a whole like trickle down effect, right? Because I can't get to, I can't find a doctor because the doctors are all busy doing these little right. appointments with the people they've had for so long. And so it kind of like, it just, every, the whole system is so stuffed, you can't get yeah. in. I mean, yeah. if you had that type of ability to do that. So is it a busy, is it, are people using it? Or? People are using our service. Keep in mind, and again, I, I want to, keep this high level because we can numb ourselves with healthcare stuff. But a lot of the telemedicine was uh, the result of this uh, emergency use act that the Congress, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to say Congress, but some agency uh, uh, in the U.S. said, OK, we will compensate you doctors for doing telemedicine because prior to that, they weren't in oh, most cases, okay. right? And so we have this sort of temporary window, which COVID basically caused, where uh, you know insurance will cover if you talk to a doctor by telemedicine. That may go away. We're, we're going to find out if they're going to extend it or not. So you might see a situation where doctors go, yeah, Jen, this time I want you to come in the office because they're not getting paid for that telemedicine visit. And they should get paid, by the way, for it. Right. And right. so, you know, don't forget there's policy floating around in here that might impact, you know, basically how much you pay and, and you know, what doctors might want to do. Right. right. So then you guys are getting paid through the referral, through... Correct through, um, how about like ad, like advertisers? Sorry, we also have ads. So uh, when brand manufacturers and other folks who want to get in front of someone who has whatever diabetes, um, yeah, they will put ads in front of it. It's just like any other site where they may want to advertise their drug or something like that, yeah. Right, and so I got to ask you this one about Amazon. So now that Amazon is coming into the market, mm -hmm. how does that affect your business? So everyone, screams when they hear the word Amazon. <laughs> I, I mean, like, um, for good reason. And they assume that it's like, a, you know, GoodRx versus Amazon, A versus B. Yeah. But that's actually, again, healthcare is complicated. Um, suffice to say that I don't see it that way at all. Um, Amazon, what, what is Amazon good at? They're good at putting things in boxes and sending them to your house. They're right. amazing at that. I love using them. There's probably a box in front of my house right now. The reality, what? though, is that mail order pharmacy is really, really, really hard. Mm -hmm. They've actually been trying to do it for 21 years, I think, because yeah. they were the majority investor in drugstore.com, mm -hmm. which was someone woke up 21 years ago and thought, wow, we should just send drugs by mail. And they started drugstore.com. Amazon was the majority investor, and it doesn't work. Yeah. It died a it fast tanked, death. Yeah. Um, then in 2018, um, they bought a company called PillPack, who we're very friendly with. And you can actually use a GoodRx discount at PillPack. Um, and PillPack said, we're going to do mail order better. And they've tried, I would argue, do you have any friends using PillPack? It's, it hasn't no. exploded the way other, and, and the reality What's is, PillPack is, again? It's PillPack like, is a mail order pharmacy that the, the, their kind of unique wrinkle is that they put all your, if you take multiple drugs, they put them yeah. in like a little sachet or something. Okay. And so it's like, oh, it's Wednesday morning and all my drugs will be, instead of just each bottle separately, right? Oh, um, oh like one of those. There's so many people doing that there. though. Yeah. And yeah. so, but the punchline is, um, about 5% of the fills, fill, prescription fills in this country uh, are mail order. And even mm. when COVID hit, you thought, oh my God, this is mail's 
day in the sun, right? Yeah. It went up like slightly and now it's actually decreasing again because people like going to the pharmacy, believe it or not. They like talking to the pharmacist and say, hey, what's this thing on my arm? And, you know, feeling a little dizzy from yeah. this drug. Uh, they pick up their shampoo and their toothpaste while they're there. There's also a lot of insurance things. Like, for example, Amazon can only sell you a 30 day fill. And a lot of people want it to have 90 days of a prescription. Um, oh. So there's a lot of like, Again, in the weird intricacies and complexity of pharmacy, um, it's not like, you know, you can't wake up tomorrow and start Jen's online pharmacy if you want to be able to take insurance. Right. You have to make this fateful decision of, am I going to play the game or am I just going to end run it and try and just do straight cash prices, right? Right. And unfortunately, it's hard. I mean, if you know, if, if Amazon was just doing cash, I think you'd, you'd have, you know, they wouldn't be able to service you on some of those fancier drugs and things that you want to do. So... It's really complicated. They also partner with Express Script. Uh -huh. What's Express? Hey, what is that? And weren't you guys yeah. partnering, or aren't you yeah. a partner too? Yeah. So who are they? So I remember before I said those nasty letters, PBM. Yeah. A PBM stands for a Prescription Benefit Management, right? Prescription Benefits Manager. And so what happens in insurance? And I, again, I because I think people will be long asleep. That it'll be a sleep podcast, <laughs> like the whole thing. When it comes to they insurance, can, they can you have, listen at night. I guess you, exactly. You have a Blue Cross or an Anthem or someone like that, right? But because drugs are so kind of uniquely complicated, they farm it out to a PBM, a okay. Pharmacy Benefits Manager. And so what? It's pharmacy benefit manager. Um, and what ends up happening is Express is the biggest one. They're actually owned by Cigna now, the insurance company. Oh, okay. Um, and so imagine again, so Anthem says, oh my God, or the Cigna in this case says, oh my God, I don't know what to do with this. And they, um, they hand it over to this PBM. The PBM then negotiates with the pharmacy, right? So um, Express Scripts, which is the largest PBM I think on the planet, um, um, didn't really, they, they watched GoodRx and they're like, what's going on with you guys? Like, what are you guys doing? They didn't at the time, have this mechanism for cash paying patients to save money. Oh, okay. And so we actually, we worked together with them. We launched InsiderX with them and we brought their discount pricing onto GoodRx, I don't know, three or four years ago, right? Right. Um, and so now they have this these coupons mm -hmm. you see on GoodRx, they have their version of that. But again, they're on GoodRx where they're a very major partner of ours. And then Amazon said, wait a second, we want to be able to show a price next to a drug. When you go on Amazon and you look something yep. up, you want to show a price. And they can't do it themselves and still take insurance. And I, I, I probably reached the end of where your audience wants to go here, but suffice it. <laughs> They've already shut it off. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just say this. Again, if you start a Gen's pharmacy and you, and you want to take yeah. insurance, you can't control your own pricing. One of the reasons why pharmacies, it must be so frustrating to be a pharmacist. Imagine if, again, you know, you sell any product, yeah, any but widget. you can't dictate your own pricing because if you do, you might violate those contracts. You might even violate government contracts, which actually can be criminal charges. Oh my so God. again, imagine, you know, poor Doug walks into Jen's pharmacy and says, Jen, give me a break on this drug. You can't just be like, Doug, you seem like a nice guy. I'm going to give it to you. Why? Forever. Didn't that woman do that for you when she, when you she ran did, out? She did. And what she actually did was a violation of her contracts with Express Scripts and companies like that, as well as, um, Again, Medicare and Medicaid have very strict rules around this stuff. Um, and so um, it's frustrating. I get it. I mean, I, I can you, it just seems as a pharmacy because yeah. what would end up happening is if you if she sold me that drug for less, let's say she sold me for a hundred bucks, right? That becomes the new benchmark for the contracts. Remember I said they get 80% yeah. off? Mm -hmm. Well, now they get 80% off of a hundred instead of 500, right? Wow. And so um, anyway, this, this, the short version is basically, it's really, really complicated. It doesn't have these normal push and pull supply and demand forces that you'd expect. And consumers need help. God, it's so comp. So. Who do you have to like to kind of just go through, decipher through this information? A lot of company? smart people, not me. A lot of smart no, I'm saying like, who do you have like someone who can actually understand this stuff? Who is this person? Well, it's funny. I mean, so I was up in. I have a place in Tahoe, and um, uh, one day one of our investors was up there, and he's like, "Hey, I'm, I'm sitting next to this guy who's talking about this pharmacy benefits manager stuff. It sounds kind of like what you guys do." And he's like, you should go call this guy. And he, so he got the guy's number. And, and so we literally walked through the woods together. And this is like 2012. And I was like, you are so smart at this. There's like three people on the planet that know this. Can I hire you? And he's you been serious? with us now for 10 years, basically. Because See? there's six people on the planet that understand this stuff. And he's one of them. Oh, so. my God. So what, what was his background that he even knows how to do this? He had worked at one of these, uh, you know, drug discount card companies. <gasps> and just knew something about it. And and. Uh, Again, it's so esoteric and strange, and yet it impacts every single person's life. In some Everybody. Capacity, so, yeah. I mean, that's what's that's amazing. So then, okay, so I asked you about all this stuff. Let's let's kind of just like 
kind of shift a little bit to more like leadership style, sure. more about your Yahoo. Now that everyone's fully asleep. Yeah, yeah exactly. We've got to wake them up a little bit. You know what I mean? Like I think either people yeah. tuned off already sure. or sure. I yeah. mean, for the three people who maybe are still exactly. listening. Hi, people. Um, exactly. Hello. <laughs> Anyone? Bueller. Um, let's go into the other stuff. So because your track record is like amazing and you were at Yahoo, you were at Facebook. I mean, you pick really well or that's first of all unbelievable how did you st like how did let's talk about your background how did you end up at yahoo what did you do what were some of the leadership um or some of the uh things that you kind of took from these jobs and then translated into be more of an entrepreneur because facebook and yahoo you were still working for for yep. somebody else or with yep. other people it wasn't your own thing yep. but you were there very early which is on its own very impressive. so what your audience doesn't know yet is that you and i are basically brother and sister, right? and we have very similar know. experiences. Yep. Um, and when I graduated college, uh, I had no idea what I wanted to do in my life. And I thought I like music. I didn't even like playing music. I just like listening to music. And so I went to go work in the music business uh, and I started at Literally. Sony. I worked at every label in town. I think much like you, <laughs> I, we probably partied at the same clubs. I know. I mean, this is why I don't, kind of, I don't even understand how I never met you until recently. It's so weird. <laughs> Um, um, and, uh, you know, I was in the music business. I was not, it was, I found it very frustrating to take something I was passionate about and then make it a career. Like I, I stopped listening to music cause I liked it. And I was listening to it because I was like, is this a single? Mm -hmm. Will this, you know, make a, it was AOR radio and stuff. And I was just like, this is not a th like, I don't want to destroy my love for music. Right. right. And so, um, because this is a long time ago, I, uh, was working at uh, at Virgin one day, and we got a fax. Uh, it was called Multimedia Wire. I remember this. Yes, there are things called faxes. Yeah. Uh, that said, there was a company that was looking for a what was they call it at the time an internet producer or something like that. And I was like, I don't know, sure. Like, and so I I, I flew up there. I was on my way to business school anyway because um, where'd I, you go? To, oh, you went to Tufts, right? I went to Tufts undergrad, and then I I um, was just kind of lost in all honesty. I had my quarter life crisis at age 25, which we can talk all about. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what to do. So I applied to business school because I thought, I don't know, maybe that'll give me a ticket to do something. And I got into business school up north. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll just go, I'll apply for this job at Yahoo. I'll work there for two months and I'll go to business school and have two years to figure it out. Um, and so I get up to Yahoo to interview. And first of all, there was no such thing as experience in 1990, early, late 95, early 96. So they were like, you have a pulse, you're hired. And I was like, well, that was, that was really <laughs> that was hard. Good. Um, and then, uh, and then literally like you're hired and now see this pool of candidates for you. You have to hire the next person. And they were all MBAs. And I was like, wait a second, hold on. You mean I'm going to, I've got this job and I'm going to leave this job, you know, to go get, and, an, to MBA, go get yeah. an MBA so that I can be online to get the job of this person working for me. And I was like, that doesn't sound good. And so I got right. a deferral for a year and I ended up never going to business school. Um, and what's great about Yahoo at the time was, it, I don't remember the number, but let's just say like 30 or something like that. People were there. Of course it was it, 30. Well, that's what it said in on, on Google, something like that. I, I, I don't remember the hard numbers, but, but Around um, 30. it was so small and amazing that it was like, I woke up one morning and I was like, we should do chat. This was back when people did text-based chat. Yeah. So I built Yahoo chat. Like it was like, uh, we should do city guides. So I built uh, Yahoo LA and Yahoo San Francisco and Yahoo Austin, where I've still never been to this day. Um, Wait, you're, you're saying yeah. these things like so like matter of fact, like, oh yeah, that I build like GeoCity. Like these are like mm -hmm. major things that in, in like, in pop culture and like our, our in our society that you basically built like as if like oh yeah and then i you know walked to ralph's and got myself a bologna sandwich i mean it's very these are how do you like, it was so fun i mean it, it you know but what is it about you like what's that quality is it that you just like you, you see things like way before it becomes something like what's that like like, I guess a superpower, like what, what is it? <laughs> I don't know if it's that, but I, I think that it all comes from a deeply, deeply rooted insecurity. <laughs> you <laughs> we, say no, that all which, the time in every, it's true. every, it's true. Uh, every interview I, I like watched, you always say that. I'm very cognizant of what people, like I wanna impact people's lives around me. Like the, when I think of my Yahoo experience over a decade, the, the biggest, most valuable moment to me was when I was on vacation with my family in Florence, Italy. And I remember, and I and I, we were walking along the Arno there, and I saw that some internet cafe back when they had those um, had a Yahoo Mail neon sign, and I was like, "Wow, they're trying to get people to come to that store because of my product, right?" Yeah. And I was like, "In Italy," and I, and I was like, "That's awesome, right?" Like that was like one of those moments where I was like, "That impacts me." And yeah. so, like you know, the stuff like when 
I'm just insecure. Like I want, I want to have a job that I'm excited, that people care about, that that I think is making a real difference. My definition of difference has changed. I think back when I was younger, I was more excited about the social media aspect, like working at Facebook. I was like, this is awesome, right? Right. right but right. now I think I care more about like the impact on people's healthcare and the long term livelihood and right. happiness. But that's different, t- kind of different time in your life. Now you're yeah. old, but at the time, no, you know, I, I, you know I heard I mean? that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, uh, I mean, in, in the earlier version of this was music actually, because like I used to be a, a very bad. DJ and like I remember just this experience of like getting people on the dance floor like I just I wanted to put a stamp on someone I wanted I wanted people to go like that is making me do something right that is improving my life and so that's kind of really just been that that decision force but like I've had this never-ending debate with my wife and friends about like you know do you just is a job just a path to make money or do whatever so that you can then enjoy the rest of your life and I just can't I can't do that like for me if I don't enjoy it I do all day I mean I I'm lucky that these have worked out for me, but I, I would otherwise just continue doing things that I enjoy doing that don't make a dime because I, I don't have the patience for other stuff. Wow. So then, or maybe the insecurity has is, is what pushes you to keep on like going and going and mm-hmm. going. So then GeoCities, all this stuff with the Yahoo stuff. And then what happens? When I turned 30, my uh, wife had earlier negotiated with me. She's a lawyer, I should point out. Mm-hmm. Um, and she wins every negotiation that we were going to travel around the world for six months. This is our, our, you know, we're about to have kids and all that kind of stuff. And so this was fortunately for us, it was 2001 before September 11th. Um, and so we sold everything we owned. I had a backpack and we traveled around the world for six months. It was amazing and wonderful. And I just to be clear, was kicking and screaming, not wanting to do it. And she was like, you're going to do this. And I was like, but I want to keep working. Wow. Um, and you quit your job for this? Well, it's funny. I said, yeah, I'm going for six months. So do what you want to do. And they were like, oh, you're going to a month from now, you'll be back because they knew me. And they were like, you're just going to go nuts. Um, but I stuck with it. And we had we did volunteer work and all this really great stuff. And then um, I remember I was in Nepal and my boss from Yahoo called me. And she said, what's the story? And I was like, well, I'm moving to L.A. because I was in San Francisco mm-hmm. at the time. And so it's been great working with you. And she's like, oh, well, it's funny you say that. We just bought a company called Launch. And Launch, if you remember, mm-hmm. was at the time CD-ROMs about music, bringing me back full circle. David Goldberg. David Goldberg, exactly. And and um, she's like, you kind of know something about music. You used to work in music. So why don't you come help us with Launch? And I was like, I don't know. That Dave Goldberg guy sounds pretty smart. I don't know if he needs my help. But what else are you doing in entertainment? And she's like, I don't know. Why don't you do that? And I was like, Okay, so all of a sudden I'm in charge of Yahoo Entertainment. I run Yahoo Movies, I run Yahoo TV. At the time, I know this sounds antiquated, but believe it or not, all of the spend of movies was in newspapers, right? Big, you know, it was, it was opening weekend, yeah. you buy a takeover. Right, right. And I was right, like, right. you know, the internet exists, people, studios. <laughs> and so I spent basically four years, um, I built an office in LA um, and basically went into every studio and said, you need to be on the internet because that's how people decide, like, and had all these bizarro experiences where Hollywood met tech and kind of blew my brain at how um, how they needed to be educated on. And you on figured that one out also. Yeah. But yeah. you make it sound like it's like very Forrest Gumpy, like you just like stumbled upon this thing. But it was more than that, right? Because then when you got to these things, you create an entire, you disrupted again another market. I think life it, is like a box of chocolates. Yeah. No, I'm just <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, you know, I honestly, I mean, I. The facts are the facts. I was moving to LA, mm-hmm. and they wow. had an opportunity. Why were you moving and, to LA? Uh, my wife's family, my and my family, my wife's family uh, were down here, and um, my wife had given me my my five years in, in San Francisco. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> um, anyway, and so yeah, so then I was here, and I ran Yahoo Entertainment, and um, but Yahoo was kind of not the same after two thousand. I don't know if you remember they hired Terry Semel, mm-hmm. and it, of it kind of I remember this. it got very focused on like basically money over over product innovation and and i just was not thrilled there and so um you know around 2004 or 5 i had become friendly with the myspace guys mm-hmm. uh if you know krista wolf and josh berman and um and they at one point talked about me joining and i was like well that's kind of interesting because it's kind of what i because at yahoo i had built all the community stuff like geocities and mail and chat and personals and stuff like that and i was like that sounds kind of cool and then literally while we're talking about it they get bought by news corp if you remember and I was like, oh. And then at the meantime, I'd also, um, a recruiter from Facebook had called Yahoo and was trying to hire this guy I knew. And the guy was like, I don't get this Facebook stuff. This is stupid, right? He's like, I'm moving to Asia because Asia is the future. And I was like, okay, <laughs> but maybe I could talk to the recruiter. And so I called the recruiter and I was like, I know you're looking for this other guy, but I kind of know something about this community stuff too. And so I actually, Mark came to LA. He was 
19, so he couldn't rent a car. So I think I, I think I picked him up at the airport. It was like the weirdest thing. I don't remember, but I just remember he couldn't move. This is pre Uber, so like he couldn't get around. He was literally 19. He yeah. was nine, some 18, 19. And so, um, you know, we talked and I told him about my experience at Yahoo. And um, next thing you know, I'm the head of product at, at Facebook. Okay, um, Forrest. <laughs> and we're, move, yeah, we're moving back up to, uh, you know, to Palo Alto. And um, yeah, that was an interesting time. Wow. So, so then you, you, he hired you and you worked right along with him, right? How was that working with him? It was weird. I mean, it was um, at the time, again, I, I don't hold me to numbers, but I want to say it was like 15, 20 people were at Facebook at the time. And uh, we were over a Chinese restaurant on University Avenue. And um, I'm, if you've seen the movie, Sean Parker, yeah. the whole nine yards. And, was, there, was that um, accurate from, from your experiences? Uh, most of it took place before me because it was like mm -hmm. right when they came. Um, my feeling on it, because I've never seen a movie before about a time that I experienced. Right. Was that I feel like movies take like one characteristic about someone and they make it that. Like, right. oh, Jen's the woman with the bottle, with the water bottle. And then that's all you are. You know, and it's the reality is people are more complex. They have their... They're, they're good things and they have their bad things. And so I just, I felt like it kind of, it kind of uh, stereotyped everyone. Yeah. And, and it, that's just not how people really are. But I think the overall story was more or less right on. Um, anyway, so at first it was great. Uh, it was me and a bunch of 19 year olds, honestly, uh, because, and I was 35 at the time. Um, and so I thought I was awesome because I would stay up till two in the morning. They'd stay up till like four or five. <laughs> then I'd get in the office at like nine or 10 and nobody would show up till like three. And, um, um, you know, we were trying to build some, I mean, at the time, just to be clear, Facebook was .edu. You couldn't, you, you were not using it unless you signed in with your alumni account or something. Right. Oh, so you weren't even, people weren't even using it. Yet. No. Yeah. And it was weird as, you know, I'd come home to my family and friends and be like, Facebook's awesome. And they'd be like, what are you talking about? That's <laughs> right? so crazy. And wow. we were, we were terrified of these companies that are long gone that we thought were going to destroy us. Like which ones were, which oh, ones? Man. Do you remember a company called Zuqua? X U Q Q A. No, I don't. We thought they were going to destroy us. We were confident they were going to destroy us at the time. Really? Um, Name another couple, another Oh, man. Few. I mean, Friendster, of course. And uh, oh, yeah, of course, MySpace was still around. You know, all these companies that were, you know, fighting it out for the social yeah. you know, top dog. Um, anyway, and so it was great. I built Facebook photos, as we talked about. Um, built a few other Facebook products. But it was, it was hard because the reality with Facebook is Mark's the head of product. He's amazing and smart. And he's the head of product and it's all of his buddies from Harvard, right? And so I walked in and I'm the, you know, I'm this new guy and I'm trying who's to- Who's old compared to these other like old, children. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I, I loved it and I will never say a bad thing about Mark. I thought it was, you know, clearly he's a smart guy. And, um, but it was, it was very hard to work together because I think at the time the idea was that he was gonna become CEO and I was gonna be the product guy, but he really wanted to be the product guy, which I get, cause I kind of do that at my own company. Right. Um, um, but I just, it was really hard to get things done there. Um, and there's all sorts of other random stories, but the punchline- Give me one random story. Oh, it was just so weird because, you know, we didn't really have even like an assistant. So like, you know, I'd pick up the phone and be like, I don't know, Rupert Murdoch or someone would be on the phone because just trying to, because you know, it was, a, it was a hot company, right? Yeah. And there was just no one there. There was no one that was doing corporate development. There was no one that was doing. So it was like, you know, I remember I'd, I'd often end up, because I was the old guy, I'd be the guy <laughs> going, oh, guess what? We're meeting the you know, CEO of, of CBS today. And Mark would be like, but why? And I'd be like, I don't know, because <laughs> because I answered the phone, you know, and like and 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 like it was just everything was a mess. I, you know, I, I can remember the phone. I can remember, like, yeah, just you know, and and it was just what was amazing is I mean the quality of the product and the quality of the people that were there was was the, the level of innovation was just super exciting. But it was just it was hard to crack the you know they say the old boys club the young, yeah. you know, young young boys club I guess which was you know literally Mark and Dustin and Adam mm -hmm. D'Angelo and. Even my co-founder Scott, these these were all literally like the first few freshmen and sophomores in college that were, you know, we'd make a decision and I go to bed and at four in the morning they'd change their mind. And um, it's not that they're bad guys. It's just you know, I, Mark's an amazing head of product. Putting two heads of product in the room together is probably not a good idea. Yeah, no, <laughs> so. apparently not. Give me one more story. This is very fascinating. Oh boy, um, people are awake again. I think. Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, it, it was. It, I mean, gosh, it, it, it was a, um, uh, there's a story that I think is true. I also have a really bad memory. So there's possible, I, I don't want to swear to this, but I do remember there was a time when we thought we were going to get like a, I won't even name the, the, but one of the biggest bands on the planet 
we had someone had come up with this idea that we were going to have this band to announce a new feature perform above the Chinese restaurant we were at on University Avenue in Palo Alto. The problem was that, first of all, it was an active Chinese restaurant where like, like there was like <laughs> low main smoke was spewing out. Right. And I'm like, and you can imagine this band, like, you know, I don't know, it wasn't Aerosmith, but pretend it was Aerosmith, you know, was like, it, was it like Coldplay? It was like even bigger. <laughs> you too? No comment. Um, so, Matthews band and you too. It was like that level of a band. But Who's the, bigger than you too? It, it was like that level of a band. Will you tell me after? I, maybe I'll tell you after. Okay, but okay, okay. The only reason I want to tell you is because I mean, I, I remember it as this, which is like someone had come up with this idea. But again, you've got this Chinese restaurant and you have like six foot high walls around the space where they'd be performing. So it's like now imagine, and it's University <laughs> Avenue, right? So it's like, imagine if like you're walking the street and you hear whatever Aerosmith coming from somewhere and you smell low main and you're like, <laughs> This is the launch party for the new Facebook product. <laughs> but that was hilarious. the kind of stuff that, you know, you did when you were 19. So Yeah. Did, um, what would happen then? Did the band come or not? They never did not. Thank God that did not come. They to never showed up. Okay. Um, but anyway, so, 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 um, uh, you know, after enough kind of blowouts with Mark and stuff, I was like, this is, I, I think I, I should work for myself. And so I, I left Facebook. I moved back to LA uh, and I started my first company, basically, which is a company called Daily Strength, which was basically Facebook for healthcare. Um, which was just trying to bring people together around. Didn't you sell that one too? I did. I, I raised some money for that, and then I sold that um, to Discovery, Oprah, this company called Sharecare. That that is oh, just Sharecare. <laughs> You're hilarious. Are you but, are you trying um, to be? I, I, no, I, I mean it's it, very it's very it's not endearing a, actually. It, it just oh, I yes, mean it's yes, just, I, just I don't ever want to take more credit for things that like I feel like the world works in strange ways. Like I look I. I I always, I'm often asked like, you know, teach other entrepreneurs, but I have no idea. I, th I feel like everything I do, I feel like is the last decision I'm going to make. And it's a terrible decision and I'm full of self doubt. So the idea that I'm supposed to project confidence, you know, like, like this whole idea, I always think I'm most fascinated with politicians, like it's terrible to be a flip flopper politician, right? That's the worst thing ever. If you change your mind. Yeah. Often. Really? I change my mind all the time. <laughs> like, right, 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 and right. I hope people would, as you learn more and you right. get older, right? So, um, anyway, I, whatever, I, no, I think yeah. it's so. Basically, you create this other company, sold to Sharecare. Mm -hmm. By the way, Sharecare is another really huge company. They just went public. They went public. Or okay, or and you went public when a year ago too. We went public last September. Yeah. Last September, yeah. and your stock was at twenty billion at one point, and then it dropped to a, where is it now? Eleven, twelve billion? Around twelve ish. Yeah. Yeah. Like oh, no, nothing. Um, and so basically, then that then that was your experience with Facebook and then you started your own company. Do you have a partner with that company or no? Not really. Um, I brought on some guys from Yahoo I'd work with, but that was my own thing, which was really, really stressful doing it myself. Um, yeah. You probably have some thoughts on that. <laughs> yes. Um, but um, uh, I need someone to project my insecurities onto. <laughs> I need someone that I can, I can, you know, talk to and, and think through things. Like, I, I mean, one of the things I'm like is I'm always asking, like, honestly, before we're done, I'm going to ask all the folks here, like, Tell me how you do what you do. How do you accomplish that? Why are you using that camera? Like it's I just called curiosity. Yeah, exactly. and that's what you need, though. I think with anything, that's what I think. Your superpower may be just that. Like you're just super curious and you're interested. And I think yeah. those are the two qualities that uh, people need really to be successful, right? Because that will that's how you learn and figure out how what's what what niche is not taken, what's hap what's not happening, how you can make it better. I'm I mean, not even are, sure. You know, it's interesting. It, it, I don't want to say that equals success necessarily, but what I've discovered is, um, you know, I, I assume everyone's an entrepreneur, like, cause I just like, I, it's like breathing to me. It's like, it's just, uh, sorry, not entrepreneurs, but the curiosity part is, yeah, and, I knew and, yet, and yet I will constantly run into people where they're like, yeah, I don't really care. I don't really care that this bottle cap doesn't mm -hmm. work the way I want it to, you know, like, um, and I, I know plenty of people who I think are great operators, right? And yeah. I never thought of that before, but more recently I've realized, okay, like I might be like the zero to 50 guy and then there's some, or woman, and then there's like someone else that's the 50 to 100 person, mm -hmm. right? You know, who takes a business from here to there, or takes any idea from here to there. Like executes and operates? Yeah. yeah. Like I'm, I'm best when it's like a small handful of people that are just pounding away, you mm -hmm. know, and, and getting something done. Um, but you know, like, I mean, my company has 600 people, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's, um, it requires a whole different skill set that I'm learning still. No, I think that's, so that's, that's also having self-awareness, knowing what you're good at and what you're bad at, and then playing up to your strengths and then finding other people who can complement those strengths to make yeah. something successful. Yeah. So would you say that yourself, you must be self-aware then, and you're obviously very, um, Insecure, we know that. You've said that a few times. But besides that, you must have some self-awareness. 
I, I, don't, I honestly don't know. I, 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 this is therapy for me because I get to think about the things I'm <laughs> think saying. Think about it. Think about um, it. Um, I guess I just do. I, I'm, I'm impatient and I'm, I guess, immature, and I just I do what I want to do, right? And and when I love doing something, I keep doing it. And if I don't love doing it, I try to find someone else to do it. Not because it's bad work. It's no, just I not know. work that I am not good at. I'm not good at. Which is why I mean, this co-CEO thing I have is the greatest thing ever, and I don't recommend it for anyone because I don't know how you'd find the magic that we have. But like, it's it's imagine having like your best friend sitting next to you and being like, I really love, you know, this. And that person go, I hate that, but I really love this. And you're like, I hate that. And we just like, we are, we are like oil and water in terms of like interests. And it's the greatest thing ever, right? Because it allows us to, um, you know, we're like two sides of the same hole. So yeah, good. it's amazing. Do you, so then who manages the, are you a manager though? Do you know how to manage people? Um, well? Ironically at the moment, nobody works for me which is the best thing ever. Really? And that's purposeful because my my business partner is a much better manager. He's much more concise with people. He's much more clear, I think, in negotiations. Everybody I meet at the company, no matter who it is, no matter what level, I'm like, come on in here, look at this. What do you think of this? <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> and it, would this work? And would your parents use this? And um, so, no, I don't think... Um, uh, I, I, I think it's best that way. I have, I, I have teams. So, for example, like in... January, actually late last year, I realized the COVID uh, vaccines were going to be a mess, the rollout of that. So I took a team of people and I built the biggest COVID vaccine appointment scheduler. In the how did, so how did you figure that one out? How did you know that that was going to happen? Um, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, my son is 16. My son turned to me when it was his birthday back in October and said, Dad, I want a new uh, PS5. And I was like, oh, um, okay. And I went on the internet, I searched for PS5, and I found out that it turns out that the demand for PS5 was far greater than supply. And in my light, in my head, a light bulb went off, and I was like, oh, this is exactly what's going to happen with vaccines in a few months. And, you know, there's all these crazy Russian bots, and, you know, there's all these technologies people use to basically sneak into Walmart and grab the last yeah. uh, PS5. And so I... Um, I basically took those exact same technologies. I took a crew of people and I said, we're going to build a way to index all the appointments and inventory across the United States for, for COVID vaccines. And then we're just going to present it to people in a really easy way. And of course, you know, now we're on the tail side of it. So we're actually shutting it down because there's now supply has caught up with demand. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there were, as you may remember, there were like three months there where like people just couldn't find it. And yeah. this wasn't a profit making thing. It was just like, here's a healthcare pain point that someone needs to solve. And we're going to solve. We had, what, 2.5 million people gave us their cell phones. So we would text them when we found appointments um, or if there's like an update to eligibility. It was awesome. It was really fun. It was fun to build because I felt like I was making a difference. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. No. But this was my my two cents. For and, and also, I mean, it sounds also that, again, you found a pain point. And then how did that, how did COVID then change your business? Because you said that earlier mm -hmm. before, like, oh, ask me about that. Besides, of course, solving a problem and a pain point. For people to get it did 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 you see an uptick what else did you like what else did you see well we saw a rise in telemedicine because people like literally doctor's offices were closed yeah. literally pharmacies were closed um uh we saw a a stockpiling of prescriptions where when people knew this was going to happen people got like extra prescriptions and then you know things were tough for people for what most of 2020 where they just they weren't going out they were staying home they were letting all I, there's a there was a study done by a third-party company that in this country there's 1.1 billion undiagnosed conditions from COVID, meaning like that thing that you wanted to have looked at that you never you know dealt yeah. with right uh and so now we're seeing the world sort of starting to work through that but the problem is in healthcare you know, a doctor can only see so many people. So a lot of those right. undiagnosed conditions are going to remain that way, right? Um, and so on the positive side, negative for us, but positive for the world, there was no cold and flu season, which actually drives a lot, some usage from GoodRx. Yeah. Um, it was kind of interesting, though, wow. that, that um, we had a non-existent flu season. Um, again, I'm, I'm happy about that because it's good for people. But, um, you know, uh, a lot of people, their first entree into GoodRx is they're getting Tamiflu or something like that. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 exactly. Wow. So what's next for GoodRx then? Do you have anything, any big plans happening? Or oh, long list, long list. I mean, anything you want to share <laughs> with us? <laughs> well, I'm a public company now. So. I, I mean, no, 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 no. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, you know, I feel like we have done a okay job at impacting prescriptions and giving more information to people about how much drugs should cost. That is 10% of the $4 trillion that's spent in this country. So the other 90% is just sitting there with no visibility, no information. And to, like a great example, someone I know um, has a hernia. They've had it for five years, but they don't really have insurance and they can't be bothered and they don't know what to do. And they know that they won't be able to afford it. Right. So they live with a hernia. It just sucks. And I see this person and they're constantly like this. And it's like, 
oh my God, right? Like, and so, and that's just one of a thousand examples, a million examples. Um, and so I want to take the same magic that, that GoodRx brings, which I think is again, education and information and knowledge and empowerment to people uh, and extend it to the rest of healthcare because it's just such a massive market. And it can, I mean, I actually, at this point, I'm not doing this for, for money as much as like, I think we can actually dramatically impact the country, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not going to wait around for the system to fix itself because it's just, there's way too many entrenched forces in government. So I'm just going to end run the whole thing, I, yeah. I'm, right? I'm just going to be like, okay, fine. How, what if you just pay cash? What if you just pay cash to see a doctor and you, and you pay cash? Doctors willing to accept X, you give them X. You know, if you want to get a drug, pharmacies will accept Y, you give them Y. Yeah. And so I'm going to do everything I can to just make a more common sense version of care. That's incredible. So, so can you give us an example of what you're going to be doing? <laughs> I mean, launching? I'm really, really interested in, I, I, I mean, an area I'm really interested in, for example, we don't have a product here necessarily, but um, I do think that mental health is broken. Uh, specifically, like, you know, if you live in fancy West Side LA, you'll pay 800 bucks to see a shrink. Coverage is awful. So it's basically Crazy. cash pay. Um, but the That's rest- That's disgusting, by yeah. the way. Nowhere else in the world, though, that would be the case, right. you know? It's right. just totally taking advantage. And there's just, the coverage is awful. Um, uh, and so people just don't get it. And especially with COVID where the study, I mean, every survey you see is like, you know, 20 or 40% of this country is dealing with some sort of mental health issue. And so I am very, very curious about that space because I think there are so many other ways that people can get help at an affordable cost, both for both of the medication side and potentially on the therapy side. Uh, and there's some great companies that are doing yeah, stuff here say, too. There's a few of them, I, you know. There's a few floating around. A lot of them are working within your commercial insurance plan, oh, okay. um, which is one option. Um, but I also just, I think there's so, I, I wanna connect all the pieces of, of mental health better. So it's an area I'm really, really interested in right now. Wow, this is so exciting. Well, you can, well I mean, I've taken up probably well, I hope it's people like are still like five away. minutes. I know exactly. Yeah, well, maybe <laughs> six, seven minutes for the people who are still listening. Um, but no, this is actually you've been. Will you come back? And I didn't. Like, oh, I got, I got the invite. I, I, I mean, I said to everybody, I did tell you that, but right. I really mean it with you. I really. But I have other questions. I have like, but I can ask. Well, let me ask you a couple. What is your? This is about habits and hustle. Tell me the day in the, the day in the life of you. Oh boy. Yeah. What mm. are your habits and what is your? Well, we know your hustle. But um, what is your habits? Well, I'm 50 years old, believe it or not. And so I've realized that if I'm going to be on this planet for much longer, I need to really focus on health and exercise and stuff. So I, I'm crazy about, I walk to work as much as I can. I Peloton like crazy. I play soccer. I mountain bike with your husband. Yeah. I was gonna say, yep. <laughs> um, and uh, I, uh, so I, I mean, I'm very focused on just making sure that I, you know, maintain physical health. I've more recently gotten into um, online courses just because you can actually get really, really great, mm -hmm. incredible courses from anywhere. Like I just took a University of Pennsylvania course on comparative health systems because I realized that when I talk about places like Canada, I may as well actually know what I'm talking about instead of just imagining what it's like in Canada. Um, <laughs> you went to camp there. Yeah. I did go to camp. <laughs> so I have that 16 year old version. Yeah. Um, what else am I doing? Um, you know, what time I, do you wake up in the morning? I'm going to ask you if you rapid I, fire. I have kids, so you know, uh, seven, but they're older. Seven, seven thirty, something like that. They are. That's true. But yeah. about seven. Do you? What do you? What's your favorite food? Oh, uh, Vietnamese for sure. Yeah. Okay. What do you eat every morning? Is there like something? Well, I try to intermittent fast, so gonna, supposedly nothing, but I'm not going to say that always happens. So you, <laughs> so. Do, so you do try to intermittent fast, though. I, I have tried for a while. Yeah. And would you say you're 50% successful? At the moment, I'm 50% successful, yeah. Okay, so what's your window? Is it 12, what's your 12? Uh, I stop, I'd, I'd like to stop eating by eight, which makes me really old, because I'm the guy going for the 5.30 dinner at rest, yeah. you know? um, and uh, not eat till You should move to noon. Florida. Exactly. Yeah. Both. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I try not to eat between 8 p.m. and noon, but I'm not super religious about it. Okay, so you're intermittent fast. What time do you get to work? Well, now I walk to work and stuff. I mean, generally 9.30 ish, something like that. But I, I start work. I mean, again, for me, I'm working all the time because I'm constantly asking right. questions. I'm constantly like, I love going to the pharmacy for any member of my family because every time I go, I learn something. You know, if there's any like health related task I can do for anyone, I want to do it because I'll, I'll start calling you then. I, let, 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 you you could be my gopher. I, I mean, I'm signed up for like 15 different services right now for 26 different things. Just so I'm constantly like it's to me, work doesn't start at 930 and stop at five. Right. It's just a, it's a 
perpetual observation. I right? think that's what's any entrepreneur, right? When you're working for yourself or now, obviously at, at a grander scale, you have to have that mindset. Yeah. Um, where, where do people find more information about, I guess, your company? They could find, I mean, I think you're, you're private. I mean, I'm not even a friend of yours on Instagram. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I mean uh, yeah, I mean, obviously we have our website and we're the number one medical app. We've been that way for, gosh, eight or 10 years. Um, but so, yeah, for GoodRx, you just j check out GoodRx or anything. But um, uh, for me, I don't, I don't know. Be my friend. I, I, I'm on, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. You were private. I couldn't friend you. I uh, LinkedIn, kind of like, I, you know, I, I actually am surprisingly active on LinkedIn. Like, I, this is great. I had a woman uh, to hit me up on LinkedIn today saying she's an older retired medical worker and she wants to donate her entire estate to solve the diabetes crisis. And she asked me for advice. And I was like, oh, my God, I have the perfect thing. And a wonderful woman I work with is a diabetic. She's also a product manager at GoodRx. I said, you two need to wow. talk and I hope they figure something out. That's cool amazing. That. Well, yeah. that's everyone hit up Doug on LinkedIn with any, you uh -oh. know, any issue, <laughs> question, <laughs> quandary, you know, um, yeah. that's great. Well, thank you so much for coming on. You are a delight. And uh, next time we are doing this on the treadmills, now that I know that you love to walk you as much just as you wait, do. Watch me sweat on that. I was gonna say, a you're whole new record. We're not even, we're not even like moving and you're sweating. It's, it's the New York treadmill. Uh, there you go. Yeah. It's cute. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Habits and hustle, time to get it rolling. Stay up on the grind, don't stop, keep it going. Habits and hustle, from nothing into something. All out, hosted by Jennifer Cohen. Visionaries, tune in, you can get to know them. Be inspired, this is your moment. Excuses, we ain't having that. The Habits and Hustle Podcast, powered by Habits.